Thank you. Fasting. Yes. You spend quite a lot of time, a slightly worrying amount of time, <laughs> talking about the, the benefits of fasting. And as someone who likes three meals a day, I thought, oh dear, this is this is dreadful. Tell us about fasting. Yeah, so actually, um, the whole talk on fasting and aging longevity actually stemmed from something that, that might be even less appealing to people, which is the idea of caloric restriction. Um, so caloric restriction is not malnutrition, it's not starving yourself, but it is eating at a deficit to what we would consider your basal metabolic rate needs. Um, and this was discovered over a hundred years ago. Uh, I think the first study is in rats where they basically found, oh, if they don't eat as much, they live longer. And then, you know, since then people have looked at this in yeast, flies, other, you know, rodents, and more recently in monkeys. And now they have, um, these trials in humans. And I, I think the, the one issue with caloric restriction, even though it's a, a really kind of cornerstone of longevity interventions, is that most people are not going to be able to maintain caloric restriction for the entirety of their life, or I would even say a few years. Um, so researchers actually became very interested in the concept of fasting, thinking that, well, maybe they don't have to constantly have this kind of, you know, slight deprivation or deficit in calories, but people could intermittently, you know, it's, it's easier for a few hours to deprive yourself than it is for, for decades. Um, so have a late dinner. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. If you know, you know, in 10 hours, I'm going to get to eat, you know, something really delicious. You can, you can kind of have the willpower versus, oh, I'm just going to continuously be hungry forever. Um, yeah, does so that idea, work? Does this does this intermittent fasting? Because you you talk about people sort of fasting for two days out of a week, or and mm -hmm. and does it work? Um, so the initial evidence suggests that there are probably benefits to it. I think we don't know if it's just because it actually helps people consume less calories over a whole day. Um, and I think to the exact type of fasting regimens that are more beneficial, we don't know that yet. So yeah, there's different ways you can do it. Some people will just see, yeah, we'll fast for one or two days out of the week. Some people restrict the time in which they're eating within every kind of every single 24 hour period. There are other people um, or regimens where maybe just three months out of the year, you do these short five day fast. They're not even a full water fast. They're just a very low calorie fast. And I think, you know, as science continues, we'll get a better sense of which ones are the most beneficial, which ones people can actually do and don't mind doing, um, and, and how this actually is related to all the kind of decades worth of research in caloric restriction, whether it is mimicking the same thing that you would get in caloric restriction. Hmm. So, I mean, is, there's a difference then between eating whole foods, avoiding highly processed food, but then also just not eating anything. I mean, is, is there, has anyone looked at, because when you talk about processed foods, you think about sort of um, fast food outlets who should remain nameless because they're very litigious. Um, um, but I mean, even in, in, if you just went to the supermarket in America and bought beef, it's full of antibiotics mm -hmm. and, yeah and the chicken has been washed in chlorine yeah so is is it that these things are just naturally bad for you or is it that the versions that you can get of these things in supermarkets are bad for you i think we don't know and that's a really important question right because yeah right. it could be that it's the way that we generate the food that is kind of mass produced and, and available widely to people and not necessarily the exact components that are, were in the kind of food that maybe are not too distant ancestors ate. So, mm. I mean, it wasn't that long ago, right, where we didn't have all of these issues. Um, yes. And yeah, so I think we, I, I am a big proponent for rethinking about how our food is grown and distributed and, you know, made, yeah, all of these things are things we need to consider. Mm. All right. So that's, whether you, how much you eat and what you, the kind of thing you eat, exercise, the, the, the bit of living, well, actually, I'd rather exercise more than just have, be hungry. Yeah. 
Because when you talk about caloric restriction, that sounds to me like a scientific way of avoiding saying you'll be hungry. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. you know, if you say nice, nice you can have two extra years of life as long as for 50 years you're hungry, that just doesn't yeah. sound great. Exactly. And I think people should, you know, for some people, they really want to do every, anything it takes, right, for that extra, who knows, year. I've actually asked a few people who do caloric restriction, how much, if you, you know, if you're projecting how much you're going to get from this, what would have made it worth it? And I think, you know, they all have a different answer, but you know, for a lot of them, it's not one year, right? It's, they're really hoping they're going to get at least a decade <laughs> um, or something like that. And yeah, for some of them, it's worth it. For other people, they they don't care that I don't even want, you know, I want to smoke and have my pint of beer and just enjoy and then I'm out. And that's, everyone has their kind of prerogative. And I think it's up to science to kind of tell people statistically what different things will buy them. And then they can of make the choice um but exercise is another one which i think you know has is really powerful in terms of slowing our rate of aging and you know is actually seems to be beneficial almost to anyone and at any kind of physiological state so even people who we think of as very frail and kind of the latest kind of portions of their life seem to still benefit from obviously at some point supervised physical activity, mm -hmm. but um, it doesn't seem too late to still get a benefit. And I, I always joke that if, you know, they could bottle the effects of exercise, it would be like you, you'd win a Nobel. It'd be like the most revolutionary kind of anti-aging therapeutic you could imagine. And, but do we know why exercise? I mean, there's the obvious one. Obviously, it's good for your heart and your circulation, mm -hmm. but, but is that... Is that it? I mean, the, the kind of large effect that you're talking about would seem that it would have to have effects more than just on your heart and circulation. But is that, do we know? Yeah, I don't think we know. We don't know, like, mechanistically, like, to, in terms of the cells and molecules in your body, what is happening. We don't, I don't even think we really know the timing at which the benefit happens, right? Are you, hmm. is this remodeling and benefit happening during, probably not during the exercise? And it seems to be this kind of after exercise state, but we still don't even understand dynamically how that is working. And there's there's really interesting stuff showing the effects of, on your brain, which is not, you know, an organ or a system that you would directly think would be affected by exercise. Um, it's not very muscly. Yeah, exactly. You don't think you're you. If anything, you think you kind of zone off and right. kind of turn your brain off while you're actually. But it, well, but it, but it, it has effects on the brain. Are you? Do you mean yeah. psychological effects or actually effects on the brain as an organ? Um, I mean, there's there's evidence that it decreases risk of things like dementia. And actually, probably mm -hmm. for me, one of the most exciting um, studies was actually by a colleague of mine at UC San Francisco named Saul Valida, where they basically took serum from mice that they made exercise and injected it into other mice and the mice who got the the exercise serum had better memory um and kind of cognitive oh this function. is the young blood thing yeah yeah i found that very worrying because <laughs> i had just had visions of of yeah i was going to say harvesting blood well, from these children <laughs> I was going to say someone's name and I thought maybe that would be unwise politically from, from a legal point of view. Several billionaires whose names might be familiar to people watching. I could imagine them hiring a whole village of people to run around and flog themselves to death and then just siphon off their serum and in some ghoulish kind of vampiric way be 20 years younger. From And what you're saying is that that would be possible. Um, yeah, I would, I would not be proponent of that exact <laughs> paradigm. Um, no, no, I wasn't accusing you. <laughs> and actually, I think uh, there's a TV show here in the States called Silicon Valley, where there's actually the billionaire has a blood boy and he like brings <laughs> around and like tells him what he's supposed You're to kidding be. me, really? Yeah, so there, there are already <laughs> kind of satires of this. Um, yes, but what you're saying is it's not a satire. This is a distinct possibility. Uh, I hope, yeah, I hope the blood boy thing is not a possibility, but, you know, the idea is if we can identify the factors yeah. that are actually responsible for this, we don't need to take them from other young human beings. We can, you know, engineer them or figure out exactly how to deal with this without involving, you know, innocent lives. <laughs> <laughs> right. So in other words, 
you'll be able to isolate the actual enzymes that or the proteins yeah. or the cell signaling and then presumably mm -hmm. generate those in a lab from from cells or mi engineered microbes and then just harvest them and take it as a as a like a nutrient a, you know a, like yeah a hypothet nutrient. yeah if you, if you can identify the factors that are driving this benefit then right. you could turn them into a therapeutic um, without needing to have yeah. a bunch of people in the back room exercising all day do we know any of the of these um, factors yet uh, so in that study they did identify one factor that they thought was important but I think you know it's probably going to end up being a little bit more complex. I, I would bet my money that it's not going to be one factor. Right? It's going to be, you know, exercise is this, you know, really dynamic. It, it involves so much and there's so much feedback in our, our body systems that, you know, I can't imagine it comes down to like one little thing that mm. explains everything in terms of the benefits. And also, I mean, you come to this at the end of the book, you talk about a couple of things like rapamyan. Um, mm. I think that's one of the factors you're talking about, but then you, you reveal that it's also an immunosuppressant. So mm -hmm. if you were, if you said, right, give me a whole vial full of that stuff, and merrily inject it into yourself, you'd probably get a cold and die the next day. Yeah, so so rather, yeah. It's, like you say, it's never that you can't just get it. These chemicals don't do one thing in the body, do they? Exactly. So and that's, I think that's the problem with our, with kind of biomedical research, right? Is we're always looking for this one factor that we think has the one target, but, you know, biology is so complex and so many things are doing, you know, they're all multitaskers. So, you know, we need to really understand our systems more before we try and intervene or even before we really know how to intervene. So that's why things like these behaviors or lifestyle factors where we're not in there poking and prodding, we're using our system. Our system knows how to respond to things. So you say, you know, exercise, the system knows how to respond, what things to upregulate, downregulate in that response. So I think that's why those are working much better than kind of the magic bullet or, you know, some pill that's coming out of the lab. Right. Um, you also talk about sleep and, and, and that's connected to back to stress and, and inflammation. You don't spend a lot of time on it, but but you do point out that modern life just seems to be weighted against the simple restorative of sleep. Yeah, I mean, it's something I personally will say I struggle with in terms of, you know, all of my health behaviors. I would say that would be the one I would say I need to do better at. Um, and the problem also is we, you know, again, the data comes out differently, you know, one time they say, oh, seven hours is the right amount of sleep. Another, they say, oh, no, maybe nine. Um, we don't know how much sleep each of us needs, and it's probably different for every person. Um, and, and unless you're like someone who's really monitoring your sleep with the, you know, the ring or the watch or something, you, we probably don't actually know how much sleep we're truly getting and, and in which of the different kind of sleep cycles where, you know, how much time we spend in each one. Um, but I think for a lot of us, yeah, in our society, the way it's structured, we're probably not getting the amount of sleep or even the quality of sleep that we need. Um, and, and there does seem to be very good evidence that sleep, again, uh, going back to the brain, does have an effect on potentially brain aging or risk of developing some of these kind of dementia-related pathologies. Does it, is, is the effect sort of marginal one or two percent or is it quite important because you know I, I remember going to university with people who sort of said oh I'm just going to have four hours sleep a night and 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 do super well at everything else and you know as far as he was concerned whatever effect sleep had it was so marginal it didn't matter is that true or is sleep more important than we think uh it's probably more important than we think but it's really hard again to say how important it is because a lot of this is, again, based on observational data, um, where you have to rely on the fact that you know how much people are sleeping or that they're reporting whether they're wake, waking up and having trouble going back to sleep. And then, you know, you have to link that to actual health outcomes down the road. Um, so it's really hard for a lot of these lifestyle factors to either do like a kind of the gold standard clinical trial for them or to really assess causality. Because the other issue with sleep that we don't know is whether people who are suffering from 
more health conditions are actually just getting worse sleep. And therefore it looks like worse sleep or less sleep is linked to, you know, disease, but it, it could go the other way around. So mm. yeah, we're, we're not entirely sure, but clearly sleep is important physiologically because we've evolved to need sleep and it is important to our functioning. And you can see what depri really deprived sleep does to physiology and it's pretty traumatic. Yeah, and I mean, natural selection has gone out of its way to allow animals to sleep, even allowing them to have one half of their brain sleep while the other one carries on flying. And yeah. <laughs> sort of nutty. So, I mean, natural selection realizes sleep is very important, otherwise yes. it wouldn't go to such lengths. But, I mean, one of the one of the things which you just mentioned in passing, but it was fascinating, is you just say quite early on, look, where all these animals are made of the same tissue. Mm -hmm. And what is it? Eighty-five percent of our human protein coding genes are the same as in the mouse, but we live forty times as long. Yeah. So it's the and then the Greenland shark. You said, which again, it's made of the same tissues. Yeah. It lives three hundred years. So, so there's just a lot of scope for the actual machinery that we're made of to live. You know six months or 80 years so there yeah. is something going on I mean, why don't mice live to be 80 if they're made yeah. of almost the same stuff exactly so it's it, it's not as if they stay, really stay up the late and, and take drugs is it i mean mice live a quite <laughs> quiet life they're not burning the candle at both ends you know and, yeah uh, yeah so there's a lot of people interested in this kind of comparative biology question like you you know the biggest the reason we know chronological aging is not you know, the thing that's driving disease is really because of this, right? You can see across species, the aging rate is hugely variable. And as you said, some live a few weeks, some live, you know, a few centuries. And again, we're all made of the same kind of elements and kind of mostly have very similar uh, genetics. And really what we think it is, is how much through evolution, how much investment was basically put on offsetting kind of the natural kind of dysregulation and decline that you would see in a complex system. So in order to kind of make sure that the individuals could reach kind of an age at which they could reproduce and make sure that their offspring could survive to an age in which they can reproduce, we've evolved to kind of say, okay, you need to maintain the system up until this point. Um, but you're not going to evolve to maintain it past that point because there's no pressure to do it. Mm. And so we really, there's kind of this life history um, paradigm that's really, we think, dictating differences in lifespan ac across species. Fair enough. I mean, that makes sense. But nevertheless, the poor old mouse is made from most of the same stuff as you, yep. but you get to live to be 80 or 90 and the mouse c conks yep. out <laughs> after two but years. The system wasn't programmed to maintain it. So it just lets it, or at least, you know, to a lesser extent, right? So it's just allowed to right. degrade. But the good news for mice is if they could figure out how the stuff they're made of is used and regulated differently in us, then they mm -hmm. could live a long time. Yeah. And, and if that's true for them, then we could figure out how the Greenland shark is doing it and live 300 years, God forbid. But <laughs> Yeah, hypothet so yeah, this is, I think, what people have really been interested in studying these really long-lived uh, species. The one thing, again, comes back to this idea of these genes or, or products are doing lots of different things. So it, it could be that there are other features of the Greenland shark that it also is, you know, shared with the longevity, whatever that mechanism is. And, you know, for me, and there's other long-lived species, so like tortoises, I, I wouldn't adopt a tortoise life in order to live <laughs> you know, 150 years or whatever it may be. So, you know, there might be some things Right. that we're also endowed with that are kind of, you know, uh, that you might have to give up to, to get this other benefit too. I don't know, um, again, it's speculation, but uh, in genetics, we call this pleiotropy. So genes are important for more than one kind of trait. Um, we're going to have to get onto questions very soon because there are a million of them. Um, um, but what's happened to stem cells? Because 20 years ago, there was a, there was a great you know, interest in stem cells. And they said, you know, we can figure out how to return cells back to 
the, the age where they could repair themselves and we're all going to live to be 120. What happened? Yeah, so I think, you know, back a, a while ago, the interest in stem cells was, oh, you know, we're losing stem cells and we just need to make sure we can replenish that. We pool. should tell people what stem cells are, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Uh, so there's different kinds of stem cells. So usually stem cells are cells that can, what we call differentiate, so turn into different cell types. And there are ones that can differentiate to any cell type, then you can, you know, kind of move up and there are ones that are more specific and they can, let's say, become the blood cells or, or there's ones in our brain that can populate um, into brain cells. Uh, now there is a huge interest in stem, in the biology that's linked to stem cells in the aging field. And this really came about um, in, I think it was 2007, uh, a scientist named Shinya Yamanaka discovered four factors, so four genes, that if you express them in a cell, you can take, a, let's say, a skin cell, even from someone who's 80 years old, and convert it back to what looks like an embryonic stem cell. And actually, when we measured this epigenetic um, signature, it looks like it's age zero, even though it measured, let's say, age 80 before. Um, so so uh, aging people in aging science are actually really interested in this um, not because we want to turn our body into a bunch of stem cells, because again, you want your cell specificity. This is an important thing. But what happens is actually the aging kind of pattern seems to be what's reversed first before the cell shifts to a stem cell, to a stem state. Oh, oh, right. So they think, okay, maybe there's a way to just push it a little bit. So you now have, let's say, an old skin cell or an old brain cell. And it's just a younger version of that same cell type. Um, and there's a lot of interest in my labs working on this, other labs are working on this, to understand this program um, and how this is working. But then not to push it all the way back so it becomes an embryonic stem cell. Exactly. Because then, because then you get cancer problems. Yeah, exactly. Then the cells will differentiate. They don't know what they're really supposed to become. And that you get these nasty, what are called teratomas, which yes. are- Yes, I've seen those. They're funky old of. things. Yeah, you don't want those in your body. No, I, I saw, I saw one in a, in, a, in a bottle, and when you opened it up, it had teeth and hair. Yeah, there's all, yeah, like exactly. There's all different types of cells that are very yeah. confused about what they're supposed to be. Yeah, I don't want my cells to be confused. Yeah. I'd rather be old than confused. Yeah, exactly. I'd rather have an old liver than a, than one that a liver made teeth. out of teeth. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right, listen, um, we'll have to get on to, because, uh, yeah, there's okay. 5,000 questions here. Um, 